Hello, my name is Håkon and today I will be talking about typewriters again. Um, I would say that this video is by popular demand, although nobody has actually told me this, but I had a look at my YouTube statistics and it turns out that several of the people, not just one, but several of the people who uh, found my video about the Olympia Traveller Deluxe that I made recently, they were actually looking for Olympia SM9. Um, in the YouTube statistics, you can actually find some of the search terms used that have led to your videos. And I thought that was quite interesting because that means two things. It means that people are looking for Olympia SM9 videos and also most likely there aren't that many of them because they ended up on mine instead. So in this episode uh, of um, typewriters, I will say a little bit about the Olympia SM9 and also how it is different to an SM8. Um, this is quite a common question uh, you find in different, in, even in typewriter forums, you get this question, what is the difference between an SM8 and an SM9? Um, and also if you go on eBay to buy one and you see a typewriter that looks like an SM8 or an SM9, it could be one of three different typewriters because they are not usually marked in any way that tells you which, which is which. Um, so this range of typewriters from Olympia was uh, made from the 60s until the 80s and uh, it's a sort of a mid-range model. That is to say it's not a light ultra compact traveler typewriter. It's not a big office machine. It's right in the middle. So the M is for sort of medium middle uh, or something like that. Um, and uh, which is quite common for Olympia. They made three different models. Um, so your basic model, your mid-range model and your luxury model. This is quite a common way to do it with um, with cars as well today. Uh, the same kind of concept existed for typewriters. Um, so there's, uh, and of course the three different models are the uh, the Monica, which of course could also be a different style of typewriter altogether because uh, Olympia used the term Monica for uh, the um, sort of basic version of several of their typewriters. But usually when you see a Monica on um, on eBay for sale, it is a, uh, an, a Monica of the SM89 variety. Uh, then they have the SM8 and then the SM9. Then I'll get back to the differences between them when I have a closer look at them side by side in a few moments. Um, so uh, yeah, without much further ado, I'll, um, I'll move my camera to capture the actual typewriters and we can have a look at them. Right, so here we are. These are the two machines. There's one of these is an SM8, one is an SM9. And of course, if you know what to look for, you will already have spotted which is which. Um, there are five key differences, uh, one of which you can't spot until you actually open them up. But um, before I start, I'll say something about these two. As you can see, they have a, quite a different shell as well, different color keyboard, and that's because this is a 1966 model, this is a 1971. At any one point of time, the SM8s and SM9s would have looked the same uh, in the sort of chassis, the casing, the keys, usually, um, most of the time, um, because they used the same sort of basic um, designed for the outer shells. Now this is uh, 1966 um, with the Silver Olympia logo. This is 71 with the Olympia International Orange logo and Olympia on the side here. Um, this one has the earlier cream colored keys with the mint chip keys and also mint uh, carriage lock up here. Uh, this is a later one with the gray, the charcoal gray keys. Uh, now, so I said there's five key differences between the SM8 and the SM9. If you go on eBay and you look for these, there's a picture of a machine, sometimes an absolutely horrible picture, and um, sometimes the only thing you can spot easily is this. Um, so this is usually the easiest thing to look out for if you are 
wanting to buy an SM9. This is actually the SM9. It has a carriage release um, on both sides of the carriage. Whereas the SM8 and the Monica uh, as well doesn't have one on this side. It's only got one on this side here. So that's that's a key key difference uh, to look out for. So um, uh, otherwise, the arm here is a different design, but that's we can't really see the arm in the shot there. But they are that's just because of the different vintages. Um, so the um, <clears throat> if you have a terrible picture, first thing to look out for carriage lock. If it does not have one of these on this side, it's not an SM9. Uh, usually a Monica is easy to spot because, uh, and also a Monica would normally be listed as a Monica because it says Monica under the logo on this this model, or it says um, I think it's next to the, I think it's on this side. I think it's a little. Um, little sort of plaque like this on this side says Monica as well. Um, so that's the basic, basic model is the Monica. Now, <clears throat> so this being the SM8, this being the SM9, there are a few other differences and I'll just run you through them. Um, the first one is to do with tabs, with tabulators. Um, so this one has, <clears throat> Both of them have tab keys here, of course. Uh, but you will see in some earlier models of the SM9 that they have the tab set and tab release keys on the side of the spacebar. <clears throat> on this one, this is a slightly later model, of course. It has the uh, tab set and tab release key here, uh, or lever rather, not a key. Uh, you can also, it's got, which you may spot back here, this one, uh, as you can see, is not on the SM8, is the release all tabs lever. Uh, this one has no tab keys on the front panel at all, apart from the actual tab key. Uh, the way you set the tabs is you've got a limited number of tabs and you set them manually. I'll just show you here, if I can get this in shot. Uh, all these... Oops. Yes, so these silver things here, they are the tabs, and you, oops, that was a bit, it's a bit stiff now. Maybe this will be easier if I actually lock the carriage. So if I do like that, and uh, like so, I can, let's see, let's see if I can move these. So, okay, oh, it needs a bit of a cleaning here, I can see. So you can move these uh, and set them to your desired tab positions. Um, which means, of course, it's very fiddly to reset them as you go. Um, and uh, But of course, for somebody who does um, basic business correspondence, etc., that is fine. I mean, you, you usually have a standard template you work with, and you would be using that all the time. And uh, you just need the same tabs all the time. Um, if you need to move tabs quickly because you're doing different kinds of layouts on the page, for instance, the SM9 is the only way to go, um, certainly if you want an Olympia SM. Uh, because then you have the control from the front, you can very quickly set and remove tabs uh, and while looking at your what you're writing and you can release all of them. So it's very, very easy, uh, easy system to use for tabs. If you want anything like that if you need anything like that very often you would have an office machine but if you are on the go this is the uh still a, a portable typewriter i mean it is really heavy but it is a portable typewriter comes with a nice case and uh, is easy to bring along if you have a car anyway um right so that is uh, the tabs i mentioned the tabs and the carriage release key um and of course the uh release all tabs there um which other things was it yeah so the i'll just show you the under the hood thing here so not quite cool how these open up actually this one is uh, sort of missing a ah yes the uh piece that's bent here actually somebody has done this completely the wrong way when they've yeah, because it's supposed to stand up as much as this one, but the uh, tabs on the hair have been bent at some point. Um, um, it may not be that easy to see here, but in here, 
there's a little tab here that is not here. Uh, so on the SM9, you have a typing tension adjustment right here, which means you can set it to the key, or how hard you have to press the key from light to heavy. Uh, very good. If you type a lot, you want to set it to the adjustment that suits you. Um, so very useful. And this is usually a feature in uh, you find in most sort of high-end typewriters. So I'll have to unbend those at some point. Uh, I think that's just because somebody has lifted it up like this and they just kept pushing it up and they bent the uh, tabs out of where they were supposed to be and then, yeah. Anyway, right, so, uh, so that's it. So that's the typing tension, carriage release, uh, release all tabs and tab on the front panel. I said there were five differences. What's the fifth one I had in mind now? Uh, yes, yes, I just remember the last one, which isn't a very important one. Um, the uh, paper rest for when you're typing, it comes up. Let's see, I'll just move this a bit forward now. So it's this thing here. You On the SM9, you push a little button there on the side, and it comes popping up like so. You can adjust it for height as well if you're working on bigger pieces of paper. Uh, the height one actually even has a uh, line counter on it. And the SM8, you still have to do it manually like this, and it doesn't have an extension coming up, so it's just a nice normal standard short. So it just lifts up like this. Not a very important feature, perhaps, but uh, it does sort of show how this is a more, um, I wouldn't say sophisticated, but a certainly higher specified uh, typewriter. And now the Monica would not have, I suppose it would have the basic uh, paper rest there. We would have, the Monica does not have any tabs. Um, it's, um, I think that, of course, it doesn't have the, uh, the tension adjustment. Um, so, yeah, it's, but really, if you are looking for an SM9, of course, these, the typing action, well, if you disregard the uh, the adjustment possibility of the uh, SM9, the typing action is pretty much the same on these. Um, they're all comfortable to type on. Uh, one thing that is actually quite uh, unique about these um, compared to the other Olympia models, uh, I think actually all the Olympia models, apart from maybe the... Yeah, I think they had some portables that also had this. Um, most German typewriters in general, they have what is known as carriage shift, which means when you push down the push down the shift key, the whole carriage lifts up. It's almost like a sort of a counterbalanced uh, system. Um, but also, even though it is counterbalanced, the act of pushing down the shift key can, it can be quite heavy on some of them. So the SM8 and 9, and of course the, um, the relative Monica model, the uh, equivalent, I, would, I should say, um, they have a basket or a segment shift. Um, which is a lot lighter, it's very light to, to push down, and um, it's so much more comfortable to use if you're typing for a long time to have a, um, a basket shift, a segment shift. Um, so, I don't know why they stuck with the, uh, with the carriage shift so long, because a segment shift makes a lot more sense to me, um, and I can't see any reason why it would be any harder to adjust it or anything like that. Actually, even because it is so heavy, uh, the carriage shift would um, put a lot more strain on the adjustment screws and bolts you need to um, adjust the uh, the height for the caps and the, uh, the lowercase letters, which is something that needs adjusting on typewriters every now and again. In fact, one of the things that people find a bit charming about all the typewriters is how the letters are a bit misaligned. And and one of the uh, consistent misalignments is, of course, between the capitals and the lowercase letters. And that's just because uh, something is bent a little bit or some adjustment screws have been pushed a bit and and it just needs readjusting. So how are these to type on? Um, well, <clears throat> Oops, let's see. Very nice light action. Um, 
And also, um, if you remember my, if you have seen my Olympia Traveler Deluxe video, um, these of course also have the half spacing, um, which is very useful if you want to align something perfectly. Um, so how, by half spacing, I mean that they have a very little advertised feature of many typewriters, uh, which is that when you push the space bar down, the carriage moves half a space. When you lift it up, it moves the second half. Um, this is actually extremely useful and significant feature, but hardly anyone seems to know about it. Uh, what that means is that you can create a space between two letters, which is uh, half the normal character width. You can make it a full character width, or you can make it one and a half, or, or of course any other sort of two, two and a half, etc. But the significance of that is that you can align something perfectly centered for instance if you have two words that need to align uh, one on top of the other and one is uh, say three letters the second one is four letters you can actually make them line up perfectly and um, which is very nice to have the option uh, another thing is you can make sure that your line endings are perfectly aligned if you're trying to make sort of nice even columns um, and also it's useful for corrections because if you uh, mistype, very often a mistyping on a typewriter involves not typing the wrong letter so much. Uh, very often you bump into another key, which means you get one extra keystroke in. So when you then go and white out the word and you uh, type it again, <clears throat> you can use that uh, half space to adjust it to the space. If you actually do happen to write one letter too little, you can still squeeze it in there if you make sort of half a space on one side and half a space on the other. And um, in some typewriters, I can't remember which brand now, uh, this feature is actually known as, uh, what did they call it, smart error. What was it, smart error correct? No, something smart, something to do with, yeah, I can't remember what they call it now. Some, some kind of BS bingo thing about smart error correction feature or something like that, which just means half spacing. Um, uh, which isn't really, I think originally they weren't really, I don't know if they were thinking about correction when they <clears throat> when they introduced it, but certainly if you are, well, they probably did actually, because of the way typewriters were uh, intended to be used. Um, so, uh, yes. Because the thing about typewriters, and uh, people don't think about that so much these days. <clears throat> Excuse me, I need some water because I'm getting a bit... Uh, dry them out. Mm. Throughout most of the history that we have had typewriters, typewriters were not intended to be used for finished products, as it were. Um, what they did was they seriously increased the speed at which you could write legibly. So for instance, things that were written by hand, I mean, even if you write really fast, um, if you write really fast, it's much harder to read. Uh, uh, but of course, on a typewriter, you can type a lot faster than the fastest person can write by hand. It is more legible than certainly somebody typing that fast, and even somebody typing slowly and neatly, it's more legible and also takes up less space on the page. So there's so many positive things about it that makes it uh, highly useful for any kind of writing. Um, of course, if you're a slow typer, of course, you wouldn't type as fast as, as by hand, but that's a different story. It still would be more legible um, and more economic on the use of paper. And of course, paper has been really expensive throughout a lot of... Uh, time as well. I mean, especially, um, I mean, it's just a recent thing that paper has been so cheap. Um, so that's one thing. So, and of course, the, the way it looks with the um, monotype, which means all the letters are evenly, equally spaced, equal size on the page, is not a very um, nice look for a finished text. If you want something typeset properly, you need proportional fonts. And there are actually one or two typewriters using proportional fonts. I think it's two, um, quite expensive ones. I think there's one electric and one uh, mechanic one, which is really cool. Um, and if you want it to look nice and neat, you, you don't do a font where all the letters are the same size. 
it's not aesthetically pleasing. Um, and also you want different size spaces between the letters uh, sometimes, uh, especially if you're trying to align text to a, um, to a column width. Um, which is why for most of the time, like what typewriters were used for was uh, business correspondence, uh, legal documents, um, things like that. Um, drafts, drafts for articles, for books, for novels, etc. Playwright, and of course, um, if you see um, any kind of original screenplay from, actually some people still write on typewriters today, uh, you would normally see them uh, looking like a typewriter text because that's what they used. Uh, and that's, that's not a good use for, for tabs, by the way, as of course doing screenplays. Um, <clears throat> um, Woody Allen, for instance, famously uh, writes everything on a typewriter um, and, and quite a few others as well. Now, um, all that changed when suddenly the typewriters became obsolete. And by obsolete, I don't mean they aren't useful anymore because people often misunderstand the word obsolete to mean that something no longer has a function and it doesn't work anymore and you need to get something new <laughs> to get the job done. Um, it's uh, That's not what the word really means. Um, what it means is it's been superseded by something else that fills the same functionality, that does the same job, but better. Uh, and in the case of typewriters, it was taken over first by a sort of simple word processors. I suppose with mechanical typewriters, you could say they were superseded by electric typewriters. And then by word processors, uh, the first ones would just have a simple line of text. So you type, you see your line there, and you make your corrections, and then you enter and and do your carriage return and then the whole thing prints out on on a like a typewriter again so it's like a, a sort of midway between a, a typewriter and a computer and of course then you got computers and word processors and printers and suddenly all of these things became easier because not only could you do the typing you could also do the editing as well you didn't have to type and do the manual editing with your pen um and then type again and do the editing again and then do the typesetting and then do the printing uh, you could do everything in with a computer and a screen and with a printer. So, um, and then by then, typewriters were completely, in the correct meaning of the word, obsolete. Um, but a very interesting thing happens when something becomes obsolete. It's actually a good thing, because through most of typewriter history. Uh, the way the type looked, I mean, a normal standard functional font, like the one you get on most typewriters, um, it took on a different meaning. So um, the thing is, when you're typing on a typewriter, you are doing a sort of physical, a physical act of what you are doing is turning into words on the page. It's actually quite a nice feeling. You're feeling a very sort of direct connection with what you're doing. If you type on a computer keyboard and looking on the screen, on the other hand, you don't get that same tactile physical feedback. Uh, a lot of people also like the, the sound of typewriters um, to the extent, in fact, that when um, silent typewriters were introduced, which of course you would think there would be a huge market for because in the typing pool, it gets really loud with all these people tapping away uh, and people would have to wear sort of hearing protection and things like that, uh, or they certainly should have done. Um, when silent typewriters were introduced, people didn't like them so much because they were so silent that they couldn't sort of get into the rhythm of the typing and the rhythm of what they were doing when they were working. Um, so people actually complained and said, oh, I want my old typewriter back. Uh, when, when their office manager sort of bought them a new silent one, thinking that was a great thing. Um, and of course, today as well, that typing, it sort of, it gets you in, when you're writing and you hear that sort of clicky sound and you see the uh, letters appear on the uh, paper, you sort of connect you to the way you're writing in a different way. It gives your work a kind of rhythm, um, which sort of, it's a musical rhythm almost when you have a tapping, tapping sound. Um, and lots of people find it easier to write creatively when they do that. And there's another thing as well. 
uh, which means that you can't is that you can't go back and correct things easily. It's a lot of hassle. You have to, of course, some later electronic typewriters you had delete keys and delete ribbons. But in all the mechanical typewriters, which of course is what's most popular these days, um, as a sort of a revival nostalgia, um, you can't. You just have to keep typing. Um, so there are mistakes, yes, but it's not what you're doing when you're writing first draft. You don't want to edit and write at the same time. If you write on the computer, the temptation is there. You mistype something or miswrite something, and you want to go back and edit it right away and correct it. And it sort of it disrupts the flow of creativity. On a typewriter, you just have to keep going. And then you go back and edit it later, which is fine. Um, and lots of writers do actually prefer doing the first drafts on typewriters for that very reason. Um, it keeps them in the creative flow. It gives them that rhythm. It, uh, it's, it might sometimes slow them down a little bit as well. So you have to sort of adjust your tempo of thinking to typing and everything. And it all gets into that tap, tap, tap rhythm of the typewriter with a bing at the end of a line and you go back and you have that sort of nice sound of the carriage and you get into that creative flow it's like a meditation and um, it's a lot easier I think to achieve that on a typewriter than on a computer that's one thing another thing is the aesthetic of the mono type font which of course when it's no longer needed I mean the reason it's there in the first place is because that is the easiest mechanically the easiest way to make a typewriter. You don't need to do anything fancy for different letters. Every single character has the same width, it moves the carriage the same length, and the mechanism becomes hugely more complicated if you're trying to do different widths for different characters. So it became, it just came out of necessity because it was a limitation in how the mechanics worked. Easily, and of course, if you want reliable mechanics as well, um, uh, for instance, the uh, what's it called again? The Olivetti uh, Graphica, which is the uh, mechanical uh, proportional font typewriter. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, it actually is so complicated that they are. If you find one, they are ridiculously expensive, and they're also quite likely to uh, be um, in need of some repairs as well because. There are more things that can go wrong <coughs> with them. So anyway, that's an aside. Now, of course, you do get different fonts in typewriters, uh, but most of them have a sort of a standard sort of serif uh, font, uh, sort of courier style font. Courier on the um, computer is similar to it. And of course, different um, brands have a slightly different varieties of them, and they were all sort of licensed for, for the different companies. Excuse me. Um, and some of them are different, of course, which is nice because um, sometimes there are very subtle varieties. But the thing is, in the old days, when typewriters were not obsolete, people would think this looked ugly. They would think, oh, that's not how a finished text is supposed to look. Um, they wanted things, if you want something to look pretty, you would typeset it, use a nice proportional font, use your Palatino. Um, your times, times, Roman, all those kinds of things, and they would look very nice on paper and printed. And people were thinking, oh, that looks like a draft, uh, if they see a typewritten text like that. But today, after typewriters become obsolete, they take on different meaning. And of course, one of them, of course, as I mentioned, the, the creative flow uh, suddenly becomes apparent because uh, when you're presented with the with a successor to the typewriter and you feel that's different and you, you notice. Another thing is, of course, the font, because now on a computer you can do absolutely anything with um, with type. You can use any font you like, and you can use typewriter fonts too. But if you use a typewriter font on a computer, it doesn't look like it's typed on a typewriter because that's just one, usually it's just one letter of each one that is scanned in and then you use that and it looks like it's written on a computer rather than on a typewriter so why would you do that so one of the things people like them for is the aesthetics of the type so because one letter you can type very lightly let's see like that and then you can do 
more heavily and you get a whole range of probably can't see that so well now but from light to dark um and of course when you type naturally you get different pressures on different keys and you don't always hit them with the same strength and you get a lot of variety in the type some typewriters of course more uh, likely to create that variation than others uh, electronic typewriters of course you you your own key press is not what causes the actual mechanical imprint on the paper and so um they all quite equal actually look more like a, like it's printed on a, on the printer and you do also have uh daisy wheel printers that pretty much work like electronic typewriters um having these sort of type type slugs on it uh that create the imprint on the paper rather than the dot matrix that came uh, later or around the same time really so that means that aesthetically uh today the typewritten text is a lot more fascinating to people it's uh it's a nostalgic thing and also it's got a sort of human element to it it's very organic because of that variation uh the slightly misaligned letters um sometimes on some typewriters sometimes it's a little bit of skew sideways as well uh not just up and down uh, of course you can adjust the all these uh, type of bars here to be exactly in line, but of course then it gets boring again, I think. So when I get a new typewriter, of course I'm not gonna buy any more now, I've, I've got enough. But um, if I find that it's sort of misaligned in an interesting way, I've, I think that is, that's what sort of becomes my favorite typewriters almost right away because I like that little quirky personality they have. And these are things you can't replicate realistically on on a computer so um so there are many reasons today why typewriters are completely obsolete but they also have a new meaning entirely and of course the same thing has happened to uh letter writing and card writing because you now have emails and you have other means of communicating you have snapchat you have uh, whatsapp etc etc and facebook and all those things people don't need to send letters or write cards anymore but what happened interestingly when when email became a big thing one of the first things that happened was that people started making their own cards something they hadn't done before or at least not very much until then people have been buying cards and sending them because well you bought cards all the time you sent them um but when you don't have to use a card as a means of communication when a card becomes obsolete um then it takes on a different meaning and you put more into it and it becomes a more personal thing um and the same today i think if somebody writes a letter by hand um which they can do that is quite a personal thing of course but also if you write it on a typewriter it becomes a very personal thing and people think if you receive a, a typewritten letter, that means the sender really wanted to sort of make an effort of making it sort of personal and special because you would normally just send an email. So and that's another thing about the typewriters. So um, other uh, examples of obsolescence is, uh, of course, film cameras. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> photographic film um of course has become uh, redundant uh because of digital um first for stills cameras and then of course later for cinema cameras as well and uh and even sort of large format cameras is sort of on, on the verge of of film becoming obsolete and of course once <clears throat> you don't need to use film anymore and you can use digital and you can do whatever you want with the with the things lots of people they want to use film cameras again so when digital became a big thing there was also a resurgence of people wanting to get into medium format photography and using older film cameras um because they were obsolete they take on a new meaning and of course the aesthetic of them uh, which is different to digital becomes more interesting so it's not taken for granted anymore. I mean, when, when typewriters were used everywhere, 
people just took it for granted. It was a functional item. It was something used for work. Uh, the type was just meant to be easy to read and fast to type. Um, and and save space and etc cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's really nice. One of the best things that happened to typewriters is becoming obsolete. The bad thing is, of course, that at the moment nobody is making proper typewriters. Um, if you want a good typewriter, you have to buy an old one like this from 1966 or this from 71. My oldest one is from 1929. I got a uh, that's not in working order though. I got one from 1935 that is still in perfect working order. So of course they were built to last, uh, at least until the mid 70s. Um, and <clears throat> I think there would be a market today for typewriters, but think about it. The, these typewriters, when they were new, they would have cost the equivalent of many hundred pounds or dollars uh, to buy. Uh, I'm not sure how many because I haven't actually looked at any prices of these. They would be quite expensive. I mean, they would, would be the equivalent of buying a, um, and of course, relative to income, etc. They would be probably more than a thousand pounds or a thousand dollars to buy. It's quite an investment, but of course it's also an investment that will last, and it's a useful item that you will have for a long, long time. Uh, so sort of part of the same, sort of quite a big chunk of the same price as, as buying a car uh, is what you would have with these, these typewriters. So if somebody made a new one today to the same kind of quality standards that you get from these old machines, um, it would be quite pricey, but of course it would be within the range of lots of buyers who are into uh, typewriters. Uh, but it really would have to be of superior quality because you can't get by doing things by halves. And of course the problem now is you can't mass produce them because the market is too small and so production becomes more expensive, etc., etc. So it's not a an ideal situation. So at the moment, it looks like all typewriters and maintaining them and repairing them is the only way to keep typewriters alive and uh, and um, and let them live out their life uh, with the new meaning they have got after they became obsolete, which I think is a more interesting one because it's a more aesthetic one and, and one to do with artistic inspiration and creativity. So I wasn't intending to to make this uh, video about that. <laughs> I just uh, just happened to start getting onto that tangent now. So um, just to sum up, summarize a little bit, if you are looking for an Olympia typewriter with a segment shift uh, of this kind, like an SM8 or an SM9 or a Monica, uh, I can actually recommend the SM9 if you because it is nice to have the um, the typing tension um, feature is probably one of the more important ones if you want a really comfortable. Uh, typewriter and of course um, if you type a lot and if you want to type a lot it's it's going to be very comfortable to use. Uh, people do call this a writer's typewriter. It's quite a common way to refer it. Uh, there are a few others that do also um, have also also been called that and I'll, I'll show you some in, in future episodes of my typewriter series. So the main thing to look out for if you see a poor horrible eBay picture and it's it's this thing here so uh, and often sellers they do not know whether the typewriter works or not because the carriage might be locked like like this and it doesn't doesn't move and I think oh it's broken um so sometimes it's a bit of a gamble buying typewriters but of course if if an eBay seller is selling a typewriter he doesn't know whether it works or not do a little bit of haggling on the price and you might end up with a real gem because it might be in great condition and the seller just wouldn't know. Um, the truth is that most of these typewriters on eBay, um, the people selling them saying they don't know how they work, they're actually being honest. They are selling them because they've inherited them or they're selling off estates and things. Um, if there's a hint that somebody seems to know about typewriters, if they have other listings of typewriters, that are better described and not sold as is, or there's actually a list of things that are right with it, or they're showing how it works, and they have one that says, I don't know if this works, then they're lying. That means they have tried it out and they just and it just um, didn't work at all. So you have to be a little bit wary and read between the lines and also do a little bit of research and, um, and have a look at 
other listings from the same seller and let's have a look at their sold listings because then you might see more typewriters so <clears throat> there's a lot of trash out there to be honest but i've been lucky i think most of my typewriter purchases have, have been rather good and i've got some really good bargains as well right i think i'll wrap it up now um uh, so i'll just oh, move this aside a little bit and just move this here so this is the sm9 um uh, let's see i can do them here so yeah it's so, um quite a nice got a nice playing at the end there as well um actually this one is quite reasonably smooth carriage and yeah it's um Nice typewriter. I got a ribbon color select here. I usually just use black ribbon. I'm not a, and of course, but you do want a color selector because you want to use uh, black, red, or you also want the ribbon not to go up at all if you are doing things with stencils, etc. So, I think that's it for the moment. Um, Olympia SM9, as requested by searches on YouTube, um, highly recommended typewriter. Very nice, comfortable segment shift, adjustable type tension, uh, carriage release on the left, and tab release and tab control on the keyboard. What's not to like? Thanks for watching, and uh, goodbye for now.